Hey guys, welcome to the Cole Cast. We're here today with David Delagardel of Cedar Lore Forge. David, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, I'm also of this well, yeah, abode. We're not talking entity. about that right now. <laughs> David's also one of our marketing guys, one yes. of our incredible influencer, uh, famous Instagram influencers no. that no. we've brought on our team along with just himself. Sure. Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, why you're sitting here across from me today. Um, I tried to, I, earlier I tried to say a quote to you guys that I would stand by, and I think that, that the artists should have um, some sort of a restraining order against talking about themselves. Or maybe there should be like a certain quota of, or, or an amount at which artists are allowed to speak about themselves. Is it about themselves or about their work? Both. <laughs> I feel very strongly about this. And I, 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 I feel strongly about it as somebody who probably has spoken about their work too much. Mm. So so for our, our listeners today. <laughs> this is me just denying. The, 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 <laughs> for our listeners today, tell me a little bit yes. about your work. You don't have to be pretentious. For, for, right? our, for, our, for the people who are listening and to the, the people who are so kindly supportive of Coal Iron Works and my strange entity that I have named Cedar Lore. Um, yeah, uh, I've been, who am I? I've been making swords for quite a while. I literally just thought that your um, cord was a hair floating in the wind and I tried to grab it, so that's great. Um, <laughs> I'm so good at answering questions <laughs> and being on task. No, yeah, I run Cedar Lore Forge and it is uh, basically a, just a fun excuse for me to uh, have fun in the realm of uh, history and uh, mythology and uh, really, Here's the fact, and I, I've said this to people at Blade Show and it makes them very confused and uncomfortable. Um, and I'll say it without using potty language. I actually don't give a crap about swords or knives. I don't, I don't really. Um, they're, they're fun and they're cool and they're, they're, they're mm -hmm. a fun, cool excuse to, in my opinion, uh, have way more deep and meaningful conversations uh, with other human beings specifically. And I'm unapologetic about this. I, I, um, my work, uh, the big secret is, and it's not a secret cause I'm sharing on a podcast is that I have a, a real heart specifically for young men and, mm -hmm. and fathers, fathers and sons, especially. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think people can probably have maybe gauged that in my work. I mean, obviously I'm a father, so I'm biased in that. And that's not to say that I don't enjoy, you know, uh, uh, networking and connecting with, um, you know, women as well in the craft I've taught, classes and I'll teach, you know, anybody, young, old man, woman, whoever, don't care what you believe or who, uh, whatever you identify with. But, but unapologetically, I, I, I am doing Cedar Lure to inspire and uh, encourage uh, young men. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the truth behind why, why I do what so I do. So you're saying, I mean, there's something there that I can really identify with because my whole pursuit of blacksmithing and forging and making in general has been more about the process and the finished work. Yeah. It's the journey there, whether it's with people around me or it's exploring my capability or it's exploring the historical significance of a material or a process or like my interest is primarily in the process of the work more yeah. so than the finished product. So I can identify with that a yeah. little bit. Um, is that always been true when you got started? Was it more about the process or was it about exploration or was it about the work? I guess, yeah, it's finished question. Work. I've never really asked myself that. Um, it has become, I guess it, 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 it kind of has always been true. I mean, to be clear, I'm not making fun of anybody who loves sword just because they're cool and they're sharp or, you know, or even blades or knives. Like, I just want to make a sword because it's dang cool. That's great. Um, but for me, that's not deep enough and mm -hmm. more uh, meaningful enough. Um, so yeah, like when Andy and I first started and for context for anybody who's just discovered coal iron works and, um, us here in our machines and, and, and then what I do, Andy's the co-founder of coal and, um, you know, our late friend and, um, you know, he passed away, uh, fighting brain cancer. Um, and, uh, that's why I love being here and, you know, hopefully continuing on a lot of the, the stuff that he believed in his legacy and being a part of that with you guys. But, um, you know, when Andy and I started, as a joke hobby on the weekends, forging swords in Robin Linda's backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, when, gosh, I mean, Andy was like 12 or 13. I was 13, 14 when we first heated up steel. Um, even then, I guess I would say I, I actually did care about this stuff because it was around that time that my dad was investing really important 
time in me and then Andy's dad in him. Mm -hmm. And even just the gesture of like Andy's dad being like, yeah, I've got this beautiful farm property and I need it to do work, but I will, um, I guess you can mess it up. <laughs> I, will, <laughs> I will love you guys by allowing you to take over my barn and infect it like a, <laughs> like a cancerous can that I can't get rid of. Um, uh, 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 a good, a good virus, a good infection in his barn. Um, so yeah, he just, you know, for a while he's like, well, I'm gonna put my tools over here. You guys don't mess with it. Um, but then he was like, it's all yeah. yours. Just take yeah. the barn. Um, yeah. all that to say, to answer your question. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't have been able to put words to this when I was a kid starting with Andy. I, I did just like, you know, we grew up on Tolkien and whatnot and, you know, Beowulf and just wanted to make cool swords. Um, but it quickly, I realized as, as, as a person and a, as a, as an artist that I want my, my work to have deeper meaning. And of course that that was true before I was a father, but you know, now that I've got Boaz, my uh, almost six year old son in my life, it's all the more true. So I do, and I do appreciate and love the craft of swordsmithing yeah. and anybody who will take the class that we're about to talk about, um, or as you know, talking to me at blade show or held my work understands that, um, obviously I'm, even though I hope nobody ever uses my swords, I'm still <laughs> aiming at making, you know, museum quality, fully mm -hmm. functional work. Um, that could be taken into battle, though I hope it never is. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. So. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, along, you know, you, you started really young, you got really interested in it, but it brought a certain level of meaning and purpose to your life and, and gave you a, a reason to continue mm -hmm. because you kept doing it. I mean, mm -hmm. you're much older now, just <laughs> decades later. So right? old, yeah. Uh, and you have pursued the same craft for a long time. In my experience, you know, some aspects of the craft that were exciting and enticing to me when I was young are shallow now. Yeah. And so I've, I've begun to say, okay, so those are still aspects of it that I appreciate, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, I'm a tool guy. I love surrounding myself with the largest, mm -hmm. most exquisite versions of things. I think that's really fun because it shows kind of a glimpse into the process of someone 150, 200 years ago, potentially, you know, uh, and speaks to their capability and their tool set and the, the historical connotations of what they were producing. I, yeah. I really appreciate that. But it's like, it's not just because the tool's old that mm -hmm. it's important. It's like the value of this greater thing. So it sounds like in your work too, you moved from the shallow to the deep. And we've talked about this extensively. Um, as you've grown in depth and appreciated the deeper aspects of the craft, mm -hmm. what you're working on, how has that then shaped your work, like mm -hmm. the practical work that you're producing, has it changed it significantly or do you just attack it from a different angle now as that pursuit of the deeper meaningful aspects of, of making swords and talking it, about journeys and it has changed it. Um, you said a lot of very good and beautiful things that I try to backtrack and we're respond to, but first I, I, I was just, it's funny what you said just now reminded me of I, just a, like minute ago I was down in you're in Logan's office and on, I loved how on your desk you have, what's the magazine? Uh, get, it's like gas engine monthly. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> and I like you guys, I, this is lovingly giving you crap that you guys are never allowed to give me uh, <laughs> crap for being a nerd. Cause that is like peak nerddom. <laughs> the, that is way beyond the Silmarillion or Tolkien's first age. How? But cause not it, even but, close. But look, here's the thing. I'm that, that is me complimenting you. Uh -huh, that is, that is, uh -huh. this is, this is, this is, yeah, I still this is love you. received. Uh -huh. Um, no, I think, uh, you know, I'm biased in my beliefs, but I, I, I know that we you know, human beings are created by a, a good and loving creator and he imbues in us, uh, especially if we take care of ourselves and choose to love others and love ourselves and live a healthy lifestyle that we, um, can and should foster, uh, uh, passions and loves and interests like that, you sure. know, especially men. I, um, yeah, of course women can have, you know, these kind of technical deep dive, uh, interests, but I think even from, even if you're secular from, from a purely biological evolutionary standpoint, that makes sense too. Like as men, we, it is in the best interest of our species to build and cultivate and, uh, sometime like niche down. And that doesn't have to be purely mechanical or, uh, uh, functional to in the building of a society. It can be fun, you know, uh, uh, I hope 
that, uh, you know, like the work Evan and I do in marketing and even if it's like in the color scheming of the website for Cole or, or whatever, that, uh, it's not just get a press and squish some steel and get the job done. It's <laughs> right. no, have fun with the process yeah. and enjoy it. Um, so to answer your question, you asked like really good, like five really good questions. <laughs> oh, asked really confusing questions. <laughs> um, um, no, uh, what, shoot, how what has, you, how has the pursuit of the deeper aspects changed your work? How has it shaped it? Yeah. Um, gosh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I mean, that, I guess maybe it's cliche or silly to say it is the work itself. What you're asking is the work I do like pursuing, uh, deep meaning in, uh, something as seemingly simple as a knife or a sword in and of itself kind of is the end pursuit. It's not just the holding of an object. Sure. Um, Maybe I, you know, again, I'm not saying every knife maker, bladesmith, uh, swordsmith needs to imbue all this like woo woo metaphysical meaning into it. Um, but, uh, for me, you know, I want to, and, I, and that, that meaning is there. It's just, are you going to take the time to cultivate it or not? Um, dang, you said a couple of really, really good things that sparked other rabbit trails that I wish I could get back to, but I think it's like, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I just, I just want to use my craft, the symbol of a sword, um, to not just, maybe this will answer your question. Um, and this is kind of spoiling a much bigger thing that I would like to discuss someday in the public. Cause it's not about me. It's not about my craft and my stuff. It's about craft as a whole in general. I, I mean, I, I even would like to, whether it's like write a blog post about this or do a whole podcast about it. I kind of have a personal, I don't know what the term is. Um, hypothesis that creativity roughly can be kind of broken down into four quadrants. Um, I've, I've never heard this from anybody else. This is just kind of like the, my paradigm I've built. I don't know if I've ever articulated this to you either. Um, you have not. So, oh gosh, now if I can just recall how I've um, mapped this out in my mind. So this, I think this could be true of, of musicians, of home builders, of guys who build, you know, steam engines, but especially bladesmiths. And that is, um, in approaching any endeavor of creativity, uh, I think first you've got, uh, the, 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 the gang who focuses on history, mm -hmm. you know, history is, is the pinnacle of what I'm focusing on, um, historical accuracy, um, honoring and building upon the shoulders of men and women before, um, then you've got, uh, the creativity, uh, quadrant crowd, which I fully acknowledge I'm probably to a fault too much in there, you know, so-called so originality though. I would argue there's nothing new under the sun, new under the sun, as the good book would say, we're all just re remixing, uh, being little C creators of the larger C creator, um, as he, you know, wants us to do and, and commands us to do. Um, and then the, the third quadrant is, um, people who love and obsess over and sometimes kind of fetishize the technical complexity of something. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of that in bladesmithing. I'm not saying that's bad. It's great. But, you know, there's some so guys. So you're identifying like, as a separate quadrant of creativity and expression. Yeah, I'm just kind of, for, yeah. in my paradigm, and there could be others, but I, 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 this is maybe oversimplifying. You know, this is kind of similar to, like, how people do these um, personality tests or, you know, right. uh, love languages or Enneagram or whatever, which has its faults and is not, you know, sure. soundproof science. But I think there's something here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, history, creativity, technicality, and then uh, functionality. Um, so, you know, a lot of engineers, of course, it's their job to focus on functionality as the peak. And then, you know, maybe aesthetic beauty, mm -hmm. creativity can follow. Um, I mean, in my experience, I'd almost disagree. I think the engineering aspect tends to function or tends to focus on the technicality. Oh, and, sure. Yeah, and, that can be, and, those are hand in hand. And I, I would say, you know, one of the things that Logan and I talk about a lot is, you know, we'll rabbit trail on an idea that changes functionality, mm -hmm. increases technicality, <laughs> and doesn't do does it doesn't contribute meaningfully in anything else. But the exercise then of allowing ourselves to kind of go through that thought process mm -hmm. three months later, we'll be posed with a question or a problem, and an aspect of that little diversion speaks eloquently 
to the solution of this new problem that's cropped up. And so uh, I've learned to kind of allow myself to explore, but I think, you know, a, a quadrantization of the creative aspects. I mean, sure. I mean, you, you can kind of see yourself in the, in, in there moving from one to the other as mm-hmm. you focus on different problems. And, um, but it's all, it's all in pursuit of, you know, you, I personally have something inside of me that I'm trying to articulate through my work. Yeah. And whether that's building a company, that's a creative expression unto yeah. itself. And, and I don't know where it would fall on your scale. It's kind of like a little bit of all of them, um, which is why I find it so tiring. <laughs> uh, Wait, what is it? What's tiring? Building a business. Oh, sure. From sure. the perspective of a creative expression, a problem solving, ex- yeah. you know, expressionist of like, it's creative, it's functional, it's technical, and it's uh, hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, and to be clear with my whole yeah. four quadrants of creativity, if you want to name it that uh, uh, idea, I'm not like placing a moral superiority oh, no, or, I didn't, on I, any, I, anything. I presume that and sounds. I also don't think people should like go as religiosity extreme as they do with any grand like, I'm a four, you know, I, I can't talk with you or, you know, like freaking like Zodiacs or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not, in, you know. You so are here's only new, making friends right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, how many people can I offend? Um You've definitely offended the engineers. Yeah. And oh, the really? Sign readers. Wait, was I mean about engin- engineer? Engineer? Because because uh, I don't. I hope I wasn't. Um, back to the my uh, yeah. my silly four quadrant idea. Um, yeah. No, there's val- a value in each, and maybe I'm missing a category, or maybe kind of like you implied, uh, the uh, the engineer quadrant and the functionality quadrant are maybe the same, or at least go hand in hand. Is what technicality? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, all I'm saying is, from my perspective, especially in bladesmithing world. Um, it seems like uh, a lot of a lot of guys kind of whether they realize it or not fall into one of those categories and maybe aren't even self aware that they're doing that. You know, like the guys who put um, crazy complex mosaic as the peak pinnacle of cool bladesmithing, and mm-hmm. it's like I don't I don't care. I, I don't care how long that took you. For me, I care about like I don't care if a, if a knife is made of mono steel, crappy steel. Uh, well, I do care if it's made of crappy steel, uh, but it, if the design is unique enough and mm-hmm. speaks to your personality, sure, I find that way more so almost inspiring. A, in the same vein as a love language, sure, in, sure. is is a way to kind of articulate your communication style mm-hmm. to the people around you. What you're saying is in this in this format, it allows you to kind of explain your creative appreciation Mm -hmm. in a way, because Mm -hmm. what you care about is creativity. And maybe even you could take that down a notch and say originality Yeah, in a way, because it's like creativity embodied within originality. Like if it's really different, that to you is the pinnacle. Whereas to Logan, it would be, is it technically, you know, complicated and functionally perfect? Yeah, you the know. things he we've I've talked with him about yeah. this before, and the things he gets all jazzed about. He's like, "Check this out!" I'm like, "Right, cool." Yeah, I'm, I'm just like, "Does it weigh fifteen thousand pounds?" No, I don't care. You know, and vice versa. I'll show <laughs> yeah. him something like, "You see this bronze sword that yeah, I just yeah. found in Denmark?" He's like, "I don't care." Um, <laughs> and so I I bring this up. It's relevant to the sword class I'm about to teach here at Cole, yeah. and hopefully to the people who are listening to me ramble about all this because I'm gonna aim with every class I teach. I try to a fully acknowledge that I'm in the camp of, um, uh, uh, over being overly creative, uh, maybe to a fault where I can easily, um, mythologize, uh, uh, pedestalize, uh, creativity and so-called originality overall, which can very quickly, any, any one of those quadrants can become very pretentious very quickly. Sure. If, uh, you don't a acknowledge that, that you default to that one. And then Mm -hmm. B don't at least try to sympathize with and step out of those boundaries. Um, so, you know, when, when Andy and I first started, of course, all I cared about was just, does it look cool enough? Does it look aesthetic? And then I quickly realized, okay, like, um, I mean, from the outset, we of course knew we need to heat treat these and stuff, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, functional quality, um, taking really seriously, uh, the people on which shoulders you're building upon, whether it's ancient, you know, Smiths who are no name or guys today that are, um, you might not like them or you compete with them, but you at least have to give credence to like, okay, I've learned from that guy and sure. he's in, and, and I respect him even yeah. if we don't see eye, eye to eye on everything. Yeah. Um, so that's something I want to really encourage, mm. uh, new and old makers to, to think about. And we're going to dial in on it, uh, in my class, you know, the whole, 
what, what do we call them in my class? Uh, fundamental, fundamentals of uh, swordsmithing or uh, something like that. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> what, tell me what I'm doing. I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Um, you know, the purpose of my class, I, I'm unapologetic about the fact that like, we're not going to be forging these blades. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, you know, and, and Andy and I first started, it's like, oh, you're, uh, stack removal blades are cheating, you know? Yeah, it's, Fundamentals of modern swords. There we go. There we go. And I did pick that name. So I'm just asking <laughs> you guys to remind me of what I picked. Um, you know, I'm unapologetic, unapologetic about the fact I'm saying unapologetic. You're really unapologetic. <laughs> you will not apologize. I think that's, this is another thing pretty. that I do. I'll, I'll latch onto one word uh-huh. and anything. And then I just yeah. repeat it. You guys have called me out on that wisely. Uh-huh. Um, no, the class is going to have, it will be some forging, um, but not much. And you know, it's funny when Andy and I were really young getting into the craft and we're over romanticizing everything. Um, cause the, you know, the craft of swordsmithing or just even general knife making is so romanticized and, and puffed up in media with the aesthetics of the sparks and the, the, the lone blacksmith forging away and his beard and he's all tough and sweaty and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, that doesn't equal good work. And, well, um, not. you know, yeah. some people sure. get so allured by the, um, I am blacksmithing sure. versus, okay, you're doing, well, you, you're, you're saying that you're doing it, but are you at, what, what does your end result look like? Sure. Are you actually producing something that's of high quality? So, um, yeah, for our class, we're going to focus on, uh, of course, aesthetics and making sure these swords are beautiful, but more importantly, um, fit and finish form and function, um, so would you say that fit and finish is the highlight of the class? That's really what you're going to focus. Cause, it's, cause uh, yeah. you had mentioned to me that you're, you're going to be learning how to specifically grind the blade, mm-hmm. but the fit and finish after the initial design. Yeah. Cause the, everybody's going to design exactly what they're going to be working. I'm going to give right? them some fairly tight parameters. Sure, um, sure. I, this isn't even stated in our class description on the website, which anybody listening who's like, oh, I want to take this class. Um, this first class that I'm teaching is for four students and it is already booked. It's end of April. Right. Um, but if there's enough interest, if you're listening to this and you'd like to take a class um, for me and don't find me too long winded and annoying, <laughs> then I would love to have you. Um, sure. And uh, so, so all that's, I, I, I truly, we would be considering and, and are open to the possibility of teaching this class again. Yeah. So reach out to us. Um, at the and uh, let us know if you'd like to take one of these sword classes. But yeah, yes, you're correct. Um, the, the pun intended, I guess points of this class will be uh, function and fit and finish. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a, a barrier boundary line, um, of the shape and style of sword. Um, sure. I have so like s- simple things like length mm-hmm. dimensions, all that's already set, mm-hmm. but so the people coming into the class are going to be, doing what exactly? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and to be clear, cause it's not stated on the, the description, I've uh, decided that we're gonna be honing in on like more or less of like a 10th century, late 10th century um, Viking-esque, but not Viking technically blade, sure. kind of like right on the cusp of the Viking age uh, and like the crusader era, both of which of those terms are very vague, but um, um, you know, straight guard, short single-handed handle, kind of the semicircle mm-hmm. Viking-esque pommel and um, a slightly tapered, but but, pretty linear straight blade, um, possibly with no fuller either. Um, a lot of people assume that Viking swords had to have, well, it's funny. I was talking with, um, uh, Seth Lopez on the phone the other day, mm-hmm. a great friend of the company and just ours personally, amazing bladesmith. Uh, anybody in the craft probably knows his name listening to this. Um, Seth Lopez on Instagram, you could check out his work and just mind boggling stuff, you know, rightly won best blade last year, best collab and something, uh, uh, at blade show. Um, and he's working on, he's, I've, I've kind of pushed and nudged him into the world of swords, uh, with help of his uh, father-in-law, who's also a mega nerd like me, um, uh, professional Tolkien artist. He does stuff for like Lucasfilm and stuff. So we're just like, make swords, Seth. Um, but Seth called me and was like, dude, like, can you give me like a 45 minute rundown on like the fundamentals of swordsmithing so I can do this (laughs) blade, right? Cause he's cranking one out before he's got a bunch of work and yeah, I gave him some like core points to focus on. Um, and why was I thinking of that? Uh, other than just bragging about Seth, cause I love him. Um, yeah, yeah. Just uh, t- it really re- was hammering this, this point away. He's, his work is unbelievable aesthetically, but I was like, uh, you, you gotta put form and function first hmm. and, um, and it's okay. You know, e- this can be applied even when you're making a fantasy sword. I think it's still worth 
um, studying, even if you have no interest in making historical one-to-one -one recreations, which I don't personally often do. <laughs> and Evan's pulled up um, for those watching and not listening. Um, those are swords, not ma made by me, but made by students um, in a class I taught at Kilroy's workshop in uh, Colorado Springs last year. Which Do was, those look pretty similar to what you're expecting to be leaving the class? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I that class was a blast. It was difficult in that um, every one of those guys was still fairly newish to the craft. Mm -hmm. um, some of them had a basic understanding, and I'd been to Kilroy's before and taken classes, um, but it was tri tricky because I had more students. I don't even think that was all of the swords. I think I had like something like seven or eight students total. Um, and then B, uh, Kilroy's, while a great place, was just really hectic and you know chaotic to, to juggle all that stuff. It's going to be much easier teaching here uh, as it's our shop, my, right, you know, I've <laughs> right. got my space, uh, and, uh, four students and, uh, um, all the guys who signed up for this first class are, you know, they're buddies, I, they're, sure. they're bladesmiths, they've got the skills. So it's going to be a yeah. lot of fun. We'll be able to, even though it's only a three day class, mm -hmm. actually shorter than the Kilroy's class, I think we'll be able to achieve sure. even more detail. More focused. Um, but yeah. the general shape of the swords that those viewing saw there is c yeah. somewhat similar. Okay. Um, but, uh, so that, yeah, those guys did a great, great job. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, stuff that's easy to overlook. It's funny. I have mad respect for like ABS and that whole world. And, you know, as a standard of quality that, that modern knife makers are, are putting out there. Um, but swords are just such a different animal. I think a lot sure. of guys who grew up in the ABS world, uh, just assume, Oh, a sword is just a big knife. You know, you just sure. make it longer. And it's like, it's really, really not. Um, and you know, you can get pretentious about this, like a sword is da -da 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 -da, all this long list of things. And Logan and other guys here in the shop have, rightly giving me crap about that of like, Oh, Dave, is this a sword? Is this a sword? Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's fun to, uh, and, and it's a good personal challenge to apply certain standards, uh, to yourself as a Smith when you venture into the world of swords. Cause yeah, you can't just make a big knife and call it a sword. Sure. Take it the blade show. And most people are not going to give you crap about it. But, um, for those who've taken the time, studied history, um, also had the opportunity, I mean, I'm blessed and thankful I've had the opportunity, you know, with Andy when we were kids, um, uh, I say kids, but we were, you know, we were like 20, 20, 23, uh, went to different museums and held original swords. Like, mm -hmm. um, the, what is it? I don't think that they're not labeled as a weapons museum anymore. Um, but there's a museum in Louisville, Kentucky, and they used to be like an arms and armor museum. Now they're just kind of a general history museum. Mm -hmm. And Andy and I got to go there and, and hold, you know, Roman swords from the time of Christ. And, um, uh, pieces that were on loan from the Royal Armories in England. And that's just, just like, I, I was talking with this about Seth on the phone yesterday and he was, his, his mind was blown. Cause I was like, dude, this is what, why I thought of him earlier. Uh, uh, he's working on a really cool kind of broadsword, and, and rightly is keeping it thicker. Uh, he, I think like around three sixteenths at the, the thickest part of the spine. And he's got a really cool fuller, really dynamic, um, geometry, uh, ground into it. Cause he's awesome to that stuff. Um, but I was like, dude, if you ever, you know, choose to make a Viking sword, something that I know will surprise you is, you know, from a profile shot, the, you know, there's the stereotype of all oh, Vikings are these big beefy bearded dudes who had these cleaver of swords, just absolute crowbars. Those swords were about eighth, eighth of an inch thick, mm. just like chef knives. Now they're wide, like two, sure. two, two to three inches wide. And, and, you know, of course it varied. Some were, were certainly, um, were, were thicker than an eighth of an inch, but g generally they were around that. Um, and, and stuff like that takes people aback, uh, mm -hmm. just totally different, you know, the, uh, approaching heat treating is a bit different. The standards, um, the, the, the fit up of the guard, the grip and the pommel is such a different animal to most knives and, and the way that a lot of like, you know, ABS guys will do their guards, which again, mad respect for that, not knocking it. It's just, it's just a different animal. Sure. And so, um, yeah, I've had a lot of uh, great friends in the craft who, you know, they, they, they came up in the craft through the ABS path which yeah. is awesome. But they said, it's like, uh, they'll sign up for like one of my classes or my Patreon or something. And they're like, this is like unlearning everything I've learned. Um, and again, not saying it's better or worse. It's just different. Yeah. So I really look forward to teaching those nitpicky things that aren't really on, in any public videos online that I've seen on YouTube or, you know, really hard info to find in, in, uh, you just can't find this info online and, sure. and, you know, uh, I'm excited to share it in person in the class. So, yeah.
Yeah. That all sounds great. So what are the, the dates of the class? Obviously this one's booked, but just for reference, it's this April. Yeah. April 24th through 26th. Is that right, Evan? Yeah. And, and you can then see all the information there, mm-hmm. obviously at coleschool.com. But, yeah. um, and like you said, if we do have more interest in a, in another class like this, we're happy to, to host you multiple times. Yeah, I would love that. Um, just kind of, we wanted to experience this year with a few classes and make sure that we're really excellent mm-hmm. at hosting, you know, small groups well, um, which I'm really excited about. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's okay. a blast. I can't wait to have people out here and, um, people have, I, I think actually Kilroy's was technically my very first, uh, time teaching a sword class. I've taught knife classes, mm, sure. forge your own ax class. Yeah. Um, but uh, swords are a different animal. Yeah. And so uh, we got a couple big to-dos in order for me to be able to teach the class. And that is you helping me learn the wonderful world of forge burners and uh, rebuilding my yeah. sword kiln. Should I've been be s- spoiled while here at, at Coal Ironworks because we've got a good working relationship with our buddy, uh, Brandon Hansley, owner of H&H Heat Treat in Muncie. Um, which is my neck of the woods. So anytime I've, I've had a sword recently or, or a batch of knives, I'm like, Hey Brandon, you know, swing right. by, but, uh, it's good to have your own setup. And so I'm really looking forward to, uh, you and I working on that, that, um, large, uh, propane forge. Um, because that is one that actually Andy and I, uh, built like literally going on 15 years ago. I think it's been in every shop we've moved coal to. Yeah. <laughs> it's come with us for yeah. some reason. It's and it's been along for the ride. It's just a, a an emptied out large propane. What's, what size propane tank? It'll be a hundred pound tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do not try, I don't know how Andy cut the top off safely, but do not try to take an angle you open You open the fill nozzle and you fill it with water. There you go. Okay. And then you cut it. That's the secret. There you go. We're not doing that portion. That's already done. Yep. And uh, we are relining it. Actually, I relined it last night. Yeah. And uh, look forward to some of these new fancy Hoppa glass burners, and yes, Gibson burners, which I think is going to make it a little better. Yeah. Cool. Well, if if people wanted to find you yeah. on the internet, they would go to. <laughs> you know, it's funny at the time of recording this. Um, uh, I still own as a URL cedarloreforge.com, but I don't even have a website up because I've just been too busy with you hooligans. <laughs> um, I literally and I, I I haven't thankfully needed a website really, but I, I'm I'm working on getting it back up. So if you type in cedarloreforge.com, uh, for now it'll it'll just take you straight to my Patreon page. So if people mm. want to learn more from me, um, and your Patreon page is, is uh, patreoncom slash cedarlore. Um, but I post the most on you know Instagram. Sure. Um, even that's kind of sporadic because um, you know I've been working on a lot of projects that I'm super grateful for and blessed with, but they're kind of top secret and I haven't been <laughs> legally allowed to without getting in trouble, um, right. from very big entities. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I post, uh, more often, you know, most often, uh, through, through coal iron works. And, uh, so I, anybody who shoots the coal iron page, uh, a message is talking to me and, um, do my best, best to help everybody or forward them on to these handsome gentlemen if I can't answer their questions. And I have a lot of fun, you know, sharing content on there and resharing other people's content. Uh, but yeah, Cedar Laura on Instagram, cedarlauraforge.com. We'll be back up at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, here at Cole and at Blade Show every year. So perfect. Yeah. Beautiful. Very handsome young man. Thank you. Yeah. Very distinguished gentleman. All right, sir. Thank you so much for visiting. Thank you, and uh, I'll see you guys later. Goodbye. Farewell. Thanks for listening. Is that okay, Evan? You want to re- reshoot the whole re- thing? Redo it all. Can we do it again? Could you could you see how I was freaking shivering the whole time? Was I twitchy and shivery? You guys should do some cold exposure. I do. <laughs>